on this edition of Sighting. <laughs> it is the most famous and well-documented abduction case on record. If I hadn't seen some of this stuff with my own eyes, there's no way I would have believed any of it. Now, for the first time, the shocking true story told by the actual victims of an alien intruder. Whoever robbed this drugstore and killed three employees got away with murder. Can a psychic now succeed where police have failed? It feels like death. When this family started renovating their historic Maryland home, something very old began to haunt them. It didn't like me because I tore down the chimney. It felt was its home. And uh, it was a very cold, negative kind of feeling, too. Very scary. And the amazing story behind those incredible pictures showing how a star is born. In his bestseller, Intruders, Bud Hopkins chronicled the lives of one Indiana family who were being victimized by what they believed were extraterrestrial invaders. The book used pseudonyms, and when a movie was made about the beleaguered family, actors portrayed them. But now, after more than a decade, the real families agreed to come forward. Here are their first-person accounts of life with the intruders. On a warm Indian summer evening, on the porch of their Indianapolis home, the Whites share a family meal. A passerby might mistake them for a typical Midwestern family, unless, of course, they'd read this book, detailing the Whites' personal history of alien abduction. There was more evidence supporting this uh, abduction than any in so far investigated the history of, of uh, the science of the comparative study of abduction, uh, the abduction phenomenon. This is the first case that let us understand the alien's purpose. The family's incredible story first came to Bud Hopkins' attention in 1983. The White's middle daughter, Debbie, wrote Hopkins a letter explaining her fear and frustration and included these photographs of strange burn marks which were appearing in the White's backyard. The grass looked like it had been compacted. There was no grass alive on it. That in itself really ticked me off because I thought my yard was nice. It was one day nice, next day no. And there it is, and it stayed like that for almost five years. Hopkins had received many letters from self-proclaimed abductees, but none had the wealth of experience and the mysterious physical evidence present in the White case. This is what happened to that nice, rich, loamy, uh, black-brown soil that uh, the backyard in Indiana had. It was turned sort of gray and, and hard as a rock. So we don't know what it is that caused this effect, but it has turned up in numerous other UFO landing cases in other parts of the world. When I got out there, when I, and, and what I learned through a few phone calls, um, the neighbors had witnessed uh, certain uh, manifestations that very night. Uh, there was this tremendous noise coming from Debbie's yard and this huge flash of light through, coming through the trees. And all the electricity went out. So we had a lot of people who could say, no, this is not something that went on in, in some young woman's head. This is something that went on outside the house, in the backyard. During that UFO encounter, Debbie had a period of missing time she could not account for. But under hypnosis, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place. We proceeded to do a hypnotic regression. And um, the story began to slowly unfold of what had happened in the period of time she couldn't recall. Things started coming out of me. Memories started coming back from all over the place. It was like this a floodgate opened up. During that session, Debbie recalled the terrifying events that preceded the mysterious burn marks on the lawn. Night that changed my life forever. I uh, happened to see a really strange light coming out of the pump house that's next to the swimming pool out back. I was thinking the prowlers, you know. And by the time I got back there in just maybe five minutes, it was gone. 
When the lights disappeared, Debbie asked her mother to babysit while Debbie went over to a girlfriend's house. Later that night, from the doorway, Debbie's mother began to see the lights as well. As I looked out the window on the bird feeder, I seen a, a light that was about the size of a basketball. And I got on the phone and I called Debbie because I was here with the two, two little ones by myself. So I hung up the phone. I said, I got to go home. There's something going on. She come in the back door, and she said, where's Dad's shotgun? And Debbie picked up the gun, went out in the back, and I watched her out the back door, and she came to the bump house, and she opened the door. I don't remember seeing a darn thing. Found my dog hiding under my dad's truck out back and tried with all my might to get her out from under the truck, and she would not come. She was screaming and squealing, and I grabbed her paws and tried to drag her, and she wouldn't come. When Debbie walked back toward the house, she saw a ball of light inside the garage. Her mother was standing, frozen, at the screen door. Sometimes when a person is being abducted, the other people are switched off, as we call it there, sort of in a state of suspended animation. All of a sudden, I feel like my whole body is on fire. Every inch of my skin is burning. And I realized I couldn't move. And I also could hardly see. It was like I'd been attacked by a mob of tourists with cameras flashing me in the eyes. Then I could see this movement in the yard in front of me. And there were six small people. I could see these big black eyes. Ooh, and I got the shivers, you know? And I'm thinking, no, this can't be. Then I can move again. It's like. I blinked and all this stuff was gone. Later we figured out I was gone in like an hour and a half. And I don't remember like 10 minutes. For months after the incident, Debbie suffered from fatigue, headache, and flu-like symptoms. The family dog died soon after the encounter from what the vet described as an illness resembling radiation poisoning. When Bud Hopkins met the family later, he administered psychological and physical tests and determined that the whites were of sound mind and body. He then began his three-year study of their abduction experiences. It would seem that the mother had had uh, childhood abduction experiences and that Debbie's sister had also had experiences as a child. Um, this is what the, the um, hypnotic sessions revealed. Uh, of course, her mother having this very deep scoop mark in the front of her leg, more or less in exactly the same place that Debbie's is. So there was a lot of reason to believe that uh, the family was associated with, the, with an abduction. Debbie's older sister, Kathy, recalled an extraordinary UFO encounter she had as a teenager in 1965. My mom had me take her uh, to a church function. It was approximately 4.30. I was driving home, and the next thing I remembered consciously, I was not on the road, I was sitting behind a church, looking up at the sky at this huge UFO that was over my car. And then just instantly, it just went so fast. It, in a blink of an eye, it was gone. It was dark, it was uh, just pitch black outside. And it was time for me to go back and get my mom, which would have made it approximately 11.30. So from sometime between 5 and 11.30, what seemed to be just a couple of minutes to me, that much time had lapsed. Under hypnosis, Kathy was able to fill in that missing time in horrifying and graphic detail. I remember being on a table. The entity I remember is very, very tall. The face was exactly like a praying mantis and it moved its head in very jerky-like manner. And I'm pretty sure, just in my own heart, that that's not the first time in 1965. I think it was very upsetting to her what she was experiencing, re-experiencing under hypnosis, and decided that was it, no more. But Debbie continued to probe her abduction experiences, recalling events from childhood. And soon, a pattern of experience developed that she believes explains why she was forced to endure painful and humiliating experimentation. Debbie's bizarre odyssey was only just beginning. Her family searched for a reason why the intruders had chosen them after this.
Next, Debbie White's terrifying repressed memory of her alien abduction. I assumed they were telling me I was this child's mother. By 1985, Debbie Jordan and her sister, Kathy Mitchell, were in the middle of a nightmarish series of experiences they could not explain. At first, they tried to see the alien intruders as a dream or a hallucination infecting their minds. The possibility that the intruders were real was too difficult to face. Bud Hopkins' three-year investigation concluded that the White family of Indianapolis had had a 30-year relationship with extraterrestrial forces, Hopkins dubbed the intruders. And when daughter Debbie was hypnotized and regressed back to earlier alien encounters, she revealed the sinister purpose behind the family's chain of abduction experience. What you are about to hear are the actual tapes from her hypnotherapy sessions. Something's not right. Okay, Debbie. Body. My stomach. Your stomach. I felt as if somebody had taken my insides and just ripped me open inside, and I could feel pulling something pulling out of me, and this little tiny thing that looked like a, a, a mouse with no skin on it, like a baby mouse, wore, squirming around, squirming around in their hand. No. crying out in pain, emotional pain, that her child is being taken from her. When this came up with Debbie, and she finally said to me that she had been pregnant and that the baby had disappeared, I realized that this was pretty important in this case. This is the first case that let us understand uh, the sexual reproductive purpose. And now we see it as central, as absolutely the, the focus of the whole thing. It was the first case, but not the last. Hopkins received correspondence from hundreds of other abductees who all told the same story. And Hopkins came to believe that the reason for the abductions was to create hybrids, half human, half alien beings. I remember being in this place. There were several of these gray things in this room. And holding their hands was a very small little person who didn't look like them. She had tufts of white cottony hair sticking out of her head all over really large eyes but human blue when i thought oh i'd love to hug you and she got this panic look on her face her eyes got huge and she darted behind one of them like she was scared to death of me and I'm, i felt real sad i asked if i could take her home with me and he told me no she couldn't survive with me i assumed they were telling me that I was this child's mother. In 1993, Debbie had a hysterectomy, and immediately after the operation, her abduction experiences ended abruptly. But her two children, now grown, continue to have experiences of their own, and Debbie's new husband, Dave, recently discovered a new scoop mark on his shin. That was another very important uh, discovery uh, that I made in that case, which of course accompanies this idea of some kind of genetic experimentation because you're gonna be doing that sort of thing across generations. The theories about why a hybrid race is being created, they're all over the map, but, but they, they tend to run to the idea that the aliens have reached some kind of evolutionary dead end and need to revivify their own species. Debbie and her sister Kathy recently collaborated on a book detailing their very personal encounters for both of them choosing to make their experiences public was a difficult decision. I just felt like it's time. Maybe it's just time to, to just do this and get it out in the open. And so right at the very last minute, the publisher called me and wanted to know if I would use my real name. I said, well, sure. 
I have to use my real face. Might as well use my real name. Coming forward and revealing their true identities has not been without a price. Although the White family is committed to the reality of alien abduction, not everyone sees their revelations as sincere. Theirs is an incredible tale beyond scientific proof. I don't expect people to believe any of the stuff that me or any of my family members tell them. Believe me, if I hadn't seen some of this stuff with my own eyes, there's no way I would have believed any of it, you know? All we know is something weird is going on, and it's happening to a lot of people, and, and people should uh, stop and think twice about it. It could happen to you. Although Debbie Jordan has not felt the presence of an intruder since 1992, she continues to counsel abductees and their families as a member of Bud Hopkins' Intruders Foundation. Next, marketing the UFO phenomenon, how the CIA used psychic visions, and have archaeologists unearthed an Incan curse. Here are some of the stories sightings is following in the news. A joint expedition by American and Peruvian archaeologists has made an historic discovery. They're now unearthing the ancient mummified remains of human sacrifices, untouched for more than 500 years. In the Peruvian Andes, the discovery of three frozen mummies may have unleashed a powerful evil curse. Archaeologists have identified the mummies as children of the ancient Incas, sacrificed some 500 years ago to appease an angry volcano god. Human sacrifices are comparatively rare in Inca culture, but quite often it was young women or the children of um, fairly well-to-do people, and it was counted an honor. Simmons is a folklorist who has studied the excavation of the mummies and other sacrificial artifacts found at the base of Peru's Sebanquia volcano. Simmons believes that their removal from this sacred site is tantamount to grave robbing. You are disturbing the situation that was set up. You're disturbing the intent if you go in and disturb that sacrifice. And that could certainly bring retrib retribution of a kind. That retribution may be a curse from the same volcano god feared and revered by the Incas. Recently, Sebankia began spewing smoke and ash again, as often as three times a day. Simmons sees this as a warning. You can think in terms of the curse following the person who did the desecrating, but the people in the immediate vicinity may suffer also by failed crops, um, their stock sicken and die, or a volcanic eruption. The mountain is upset about something. In Atlanta, Georgia, one of the largest specialty stores in the country is now offering a unique gift item that can only be described as out of this world. Inspired by the mysterious saucer crash near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, the Sharper Image is selling life-size replicas of what they call the Roswell Alien. You know, I've never seen an alien before. I'm sure everybody has conceptualized and visualized what uh, a being would look like coming from uh, outer space, so. Woodard believes that the Roswell Alien is a fitting addition to a store known for cutting-edge ideas. Overall, I think everybody knows that that's the kind of product that keeps uh, Sharper Image um, on the leading edge, if you will, in terms of mystique and uniqueness. The look of the alien is based on eyewitness accounts of creatures that many people believe were hidden away by the military after the Roswell crash, accounts the government denies. I find that there are some customers that are very well informed in terms of the amount of information that's been released, and they in turn will sometimes want to elaborate uh, with respect to their own points of views as, as it applies to the Roswell alien. The alien lists for just under $1,700, and so far, seven customers have decided they just have to have one. In Washington, D.C., a recent report issued by the Central Intelligence Agency confirms that the American government has been funding psychic research, in particular, its potential use for psychic espionage. It was top secret throughout the intelligence community. The existence was compartmented 
and provided to only a few people who had the need to know. But now that the news is out, the CIA claims that the psychic experiments have never worked and is recommending that the government stop funding for further research. While this is their official position, one psychic in the remote viewing program told sightings that there were successes. In Desert Storm, to locate Iraq's biological weapons facility and to pinpoint the location of Libya's ruler, Omar Gaddafi. We took this discovery out of the laboratory and we developed it into a militarily useful tool that could be used to support intelligence requirements in the event of a life or death situation or where deadly force was necessary. If there's something that anybody in a position of authority thinks can possibly be turned into a weapon, uh, they'll probably continue to look at it. Our forays into remote viewing continuing despite CIA claims to the contrary. Sightings will have an extended report on an upcoming program. We'll have more stories from the news next time. Now, here's what's coming up on Sightings. A psychic provides South Bend police with new clues to an unsolved murder mystery. I see what the victim sees, thus recreating the crime. Later, are these the bones of a spirit haunting a Maryland house? Psychic detective Carol Pate was called into a recent murder investigation in South Bend, Indiana. Over the telephone, she made a series of startling statements that convinced one police officer of Carol's psychic gift. Her initial impressions were so encouraging, sightings have sent Carol to South Bend so she can see, touch, and feel the actual crime scene. From Indiana, Carla Wool reports. use what's known as psychometry and that's holding a ring or a watch a personal object so if I hold a victim's say ring or photograph I then can become one with the victim I see what the victim sees thus recreating the crime I've worked with psychics in the past I do have a belief that some people have an ability that maybe you and I don't possess I do believe that there are some that have that ability no pain, no suffering, just a blow. On August 25th, 1990, three employees at this Osco drugstore in South Bend, Indiana, were shot to death during a robbery. For the community, the investigating officers, and the families of the victims, the anguish still lingers. Five years after the murders, the man police and South Bend residents believe is the killer is still walking the streets, a free man, because there just isn't enough evidence to convict him. It, it hurts to even go back and think about it. See, all these people were just in a matter of minutes, it was over. Store manager Scott Dick, clerk Connie Zalewski, and pharmacist Tracy Holvet were all shot at point blank range just before the store opened for business. What about the cameras? There were cameras in this store. The cameras had, uh, had been in place in the store, but apparently there was a malfunction. They weren't, they weren't operational at the time this occurred. Hopefully that's what Carol Pate will do. Maybe Carol Pate will be our camera. Lead Detective Sergeant D. Michael Swanson agreed to work with psychic Carol Pate because after five frustrating years on the case, any lead is better than no lead at all. I came into the case cold. I didn't know anything. The only thing, I knew there was a victim. I knew it was an Osco drug store. Uh, that's all. And that's the way I like to work a case. That way I know that what I pick up, if it comes through correctly, then it's accurate information. So Detective Swanson didn't tell Carol about the mysterious female accomplice he believes may be the key to cracking the case. The evidence indicates that we have more than one suspect. And uh, obviously we've been told that there's a female in the store. We have a witness that sees a female in the store we believe is acting as an accomplice. It's been the biggest mystery of this case for five years. Who is this woman? It's a question the victim's families want and need answered. What would it mean to you and to your family to, to be able to bring someone to justice? I think it would help. I mean, there's no doubt our family 
is going to have, you know, this hanging over our heads the rest of our life. It's not going to go away. Because when he shot her, he, he might as well have shot all of us. Carol came in cold after the store had closed. She clutched personal items the victim's families had provided to police and used these to develop psychic impressions of the crime spree. In the right direction. I feel that the man that did this, he knew the store, he knew it very well, he may have worked there. He's angry at the young man, though. He's really angry at the young man. They work for him. We're talking about a suspect. We, we believe that they work for this company in this particular store. A former manager of the That's store? That's correct. Yeah. Who was fired? Yeah, basically was fired. He was asked to, asked to resign uh, under circumstances which, which would have been forced to be fired if he hadn't. Unknown to Carol, two of the victims died on this very spot in front of the pharmacy. I'm getting a dropping down. It feels like a victim's energy and it feels like a dropping down. Separation. Tracy recognized the man and at first she felt friendly and then all of a sudden she was shot. At that point we think that they just basically walked into what, it, what was going on and, uh, and were murdered because of the fact they were there and, and, and seen who was involved in it. Then inside this 14,000 square foot store, Carol stopped in the exact location where the third victim had died. I'm getting a whole lot of trauma going on in here. And it, and it's, uh, it feels like death. She was able to focus in on the locations of where the victims were, were found. Um, the rear story of the, of the store, the storage area, the hallway or the runway, which she described as a runway area, uh, we think plays a significant part. We think there may have been uh, the suspect may encountered one or both of our females back in that particular area of the store. Carol then seemed to pick up on the one key element that police believe may lead them to a conviction. There is a female with this man. She goes back down to the front. She's checking to see if anyone's heard anything if, if because of gunshots. I get them getting money. They did get money. In fact, $6,000 was taken from the safe. Carol's remarkable accuracy convinced Detective Swanson that it was more than a lucky guess. Okay, she's coming in. Carol sat with a police sketch artist and described in detail the woman she saw in her mind's eye. The South Bend Police Department has asked sightings not to reveal the sketch of the female accomplice until they can follow up on all of Carol's startling leads. The sketch itself, names that she may come up with, locations, we're going to look at those as, as potential um, at leads. We're going to follow those and see if we can, in, in fact, uh, develop something off of something she's given us. The family wants to know what happened in that store. Maybe we'll never know, but we want to. A reward of $100,000 has been offered for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the South Bend killer. If you have information important to this case, please contact the South Bend, Indiana Police Department. Next, a secret from this home's past may be causing its haunting today. First thing that I sense from this, slaves. When Marla and Olin Schmidt started renovating their 19th century home in Westminster, Maryland, there was a lot of dust and a lot of expense and a lot of stress. But all that paled in comparison to the chilling events that followed a grisly discovery buried under the house. In the town of Westminster, Maryland, historic preservation is a priority because each building, they say, holds up a mirror to the past, reflecting its rich Civil War history. Not far from Westminster, abolitionist John Brown was executed for his heroic but unpopular efforts to end slavery in the South. It seems that in this town, 
change of any kind comes at a price. Marla Schmidt learned this lesson all too well when she found her dream house in Westminster. It was built in the mid-19th century in need of serious repairs. And as soon as the family moved in, strange figures appeared to let Marla know the house was already occupied. We moved into the house on December 25th, 1986. And that day I was cleaning and I looked up and I saw a figure of a gentleman, which at first I thought was my husband. There was no way that there was a reflection of anything. It was, it was a brief uh, figure that was there and it was gone. And my husband had been in a different part of the house uh, and he wasn't wearing the same clothes that the gentleman had on. The presence also made itself known to Marla's children. When um, my family and I moved into the house, I was 15 years old and we always felt I always thought that there was something funny about the house, especially when we moved in. One night, I just had turned off the light, and my bed started, like, going down, like somebody was sitting at the edge of my bed, and it was really, really weird. The strange forces seemed to resent the family's intrusion into the house. Ghostly forms began to appear on a regular basis, and Marla came to the difficult realization that her home was haunted. As time went on, everyone got used to the eerie encounters. They were able to cope until last year, when Marla finally put into action her ambitious plans to renovate the home. My mother and my stepfather started renovating the house, and that's when unexplainable things that had never happened here um, started happening. When I started tearing the chimney down, I discovered that it's very old and it could have possibly been here late 1700s or something. The intensity of the things happening in the house picked up immensely. On September 9th, Carla and Jennifer had seen a figure standing by the window on the second floor. It was like a dark shadow. It was kind of like you could see like the head and the shoulder. The figure in the window vanished as quickly as it had appeared. Then, in the stairwell, they saw an amorphous blue form coming at them. It was a blue mist. That's, that's the only way I can describe it. It was a blue mist, and it had a figure in it. That, uh, you could definitely see a figure. It was almost like looking at a neon light. It, it, it glowed. It was almost fluorescent. Uh, just a clear, a deep sky blue. And when it was in the corner, it had the shape almost of a human form. And then at other times, when it was around the doorway, it took the form of the doorway. There was no earthly explanation, and they were frightened. On a friend's recommendation, Marla contacted Pamela Saylor, a local psychic familiar with the area's rich history and with the disturbing paranormal activity which often occurs in the old homes of Westminster. When they first called me, fear, terror in their voices over the telephone, I could not believe it. Saylor surveyed the home and felt she had made contact almost immediately. She verified the family's worst fears about the entities here. I dealt with one entity that I felt was a very negative en entity, and the whole family was afraid of this entity. She said that it, it didn't like me because I tore down the chimney it felt was its home. And uh, it was a very cold, negative kind of feeling, too. Very scary. Sailor felt that the entity was angry, and she felt its presence most strongly in the old cellar. He said, I did not die a normal death. I said, you're in the chimney, are you not? Then I knew there had to be bones or something in this house. At first, Sailor's psychic impressions baffled the family. The thought of finding bones buried in the cellar at the base of the chimney was just beyond reason. But out of desperation, the family followed Sailor's psychic advice and began to dig. When I tore up the hearth of the old fireplace, down there and started digging around and uh, found some old bones and possibly they could be human bones. Marla removed the bones from the site herself. She was sure they must be animal bones and took them to local veterinarian Sharon Cashenbach for confirmation but the doctor would not rule out the possibility that the bones are human. Um, again perhaps a hip or a shoulder bone from either a large animal or perhaps even human. 
Removing the bones from the home may have been a mistake. It seems to have exacerbated the anger and resentment coming from the ghostly forces in the home. It is at this point that sightings and psychic Peter Anthony have come into the investigation, and Anthony senses an angry entity almost immediately. As I climbed up into the attic, uh, uh, there was a coolness, or if you want to even call it what I call a spirit. And uh, as I was up there, I, I, could, I could hear uh, this, this entity uh, walking. And Anthony does not feel the paranormal activity is limited to one room or only one spirit. When I went into the north uh, part of the home, there was a room in there that was blue. And as soon as I walked into the room, I sensed death. But it was in the cellar that Anthony made his most disturbing discovery. The first thing that I sense from this, slaves. Out of fear, they were running slaves out from the south. This was a hiding place. There's something in this dark corner over here that there's death all around in this lower area through here. Further back, in the darkest recesses of this subterranean storage area, Anthony made a psychic discovery. Oh, man. There's a murder right here in this area. There he is. Okay, he's here. Your spirit is, is here. There was a man, black male, who was just physically beaten to death. You can see this man's face, and, and uh, this black man was, was murdered here. I, 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 I can't stay here. I, I have to leave this area. Overcome with emotion, Anthony declared that this entity was responsible for much of the haunting activity. He believes that he must learn as much as he can about who this spirit is and why this place is so important to him. In the meantime, Peter Anthony has constructive suggestions for Marla and her family to at least subdue the entities. I think once the renovations are completed in the home, you'll find that these spirit uh, meetings or encounters will sort of subside go through the house and bring a little salt and candles and just release the spirits, send them on to their places. To further assist the family, Sightings has contacted an historical researcher in Westminster. She provided information linking the entity that Anthony describes as a murder victim to the real life execution of a runaway slave who may have died in the home. In the 1860s, this area was part of the Underground Railroad, providing comfort to many slaves seeking safe passage to the north. Slaves who were caught suffered brutal punishment and often death. Perhaps the spirit in the Schmidt house was one of those murdered slaves who, even in death, still seeks his freedom. Several days after our investigation, an unsettling spate of new phenomena began in the house. Peter Anthony is continuing to work with the family and believes that it may take time before the ghosts of Westminster finally move on. Next, a glimpse across the universe and back into time. The images that came out were uh, stunningly beautiful. After a rocky start, the Hubble Space Telescope is sending back pictures from deep within our universe, each one more startling than the last. Now, the Hubble has captured an event astronomers have only dreamt about, the cosmic incubator, where stars are born. Carla Wall reports. It's not what you'd expect to see in outer space, a bright, seemingly sunlit cloud of cosmic dust and gas, a place, astronomers tell us, where new stars are created. When the Hubble Space Telescope first sent back these images from the Eagle Nebula, far across the universe, even seasoned astronomers like Ann Kinney were awed by their beauty and power. The images that came out were uh, stunningly beautiful. Uh, everyone who saw them gasped <laughs> when they saw them. With a closer look, you could also see a lot of details that hadn't been seen in these star-forming regions before. With these pictures, theory became reality. There were areas in the nebula called eggs, evaporating gaseous globules. 
where astronomers discovered infant stars reaching into space. At Arizona State University, I met with Dr. Jeff Hester, the project's principal investigator, and asked him to explain the startling new Hubble pictures. What we're looking at when we look at this picture is a region where new stars are being formed. These long columns are referred to by astronomers as elephant trunks. What they are are massive columns of dense interstellar gas. They're sort of birth columns for stars. Birth columns for stars. What looks like a thundercloud is actually larger than our solar system, and it's more than 7,000 light years away. That means the images we see today are 7,000 years old. What's happening there today, we can only guess. Our sun, our planetary system, the Earth that we are sitting on, is the result of this same process of star formation. We don't have the luxury of going back four and a half billion years and watching what happened with our own sun and watching our own solar system form. But what we can do is look around us and look at regions in our galaxy where new stars are forming. And when we do that, we're coming to understand how you and I got here. And I think that buried deep down in the hearts of men is a need to do that. Some of the people who've looked at these pictures have seen not only the creation of life, but also a creator, picking up images of everything from the face of Jesus to risque messages. According to Hester, seeing these images is fun, but it's not science. When I took the pictures home and showed them to my kids, the very first thing that they started doing was picking pictures out. And maybe that's why people react to the picture so strongly. It's almost biological. It's almost as if it's familiar, but yet it's not. How can the birth of a star possibly affect us on Earth? I think that when people look at these pictures, even if they don't understand the details of the science, I think that they're awed by the fact that this is a real thing. This is out there. It's part of our universe. It's part of the things that connect us with the rest of our universe. If you have access to the Internet, you can download pictures from this and other Hubble telescope projects on several sites. You can download pictures through the Sightings Forum on America Online or on the World Wide Web, access pictures and information by typing, you better have a pencil for this one, HTTP colon double backslash www.stsci.edu backslash Pub Info, P U B I N F O. Until next time, remember no mystery is closed to an open mind. For sightings, I'm Tim White.